please stand as you are able for the reading of the scripture. Today's scripture is from Hebrews chapter 13. This letter was written to churches in and around Jerusalem. These early churches had many Jews in their congregation. Although they felt converted, they tended to slide back to obeying the laws and doing, taking the easy way out of their Christianity. So, and, it, and that's easy to, to understand because the memory of and even the persecutions were still in, on the minds of everybody during this time. So from Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 8, and 15 and 16. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for doing that some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured, as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all. Let the marriage bed be kept undefiled, for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, then I said, ah, Lord God, Truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him, then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of his lips that confess his name. Do not excuse me, neglect to do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. We love our lists, don't we? It's part of how we try and impose order onto chaos. If you've got a structure that helps you to remember things, to understand them. And so, if you go to YouTube, you'll see all kinds of lists. Uh, five things you won't believe or the top 100 film comedies, or 100 greatest movies, or songs, or famous people, or eight animals that defy science, or, you know, all kinds of things like that. And then we have our to-do lists to get done, and the honey-do lists, and all those other things that we write down and track, and oh, we love our lists. Well, today, we have a list in the scriptures, a short list of Christian virtues. And any one of these could uh, trigger a sermon by itself. In fact, you could have the seven Christian virtues sermon series and just, you know, advertise that if you want it. Let's see what's there. Number one. Let mutual love, brotherly love, continue. Number two, practice hospitality. Number three, remember those who are in trouble. Four, be pure, be moral. Number five, don't love money. Trust God and be content. Six, Remember and try to be like those who were strong in the faith but are no longer with us. Seven, praise God and do not neglect to do good. Now, these are the sorts of things that look good when they're framed and hanging on the wall. And we used to do that. They were called samplers. 
and women particularly would cross stitch them these scripture verses and they'd put them up around the house can you imagine practice hospitality you could put that either right by the front door or in the kitchen just to remind you to do that like I said all of these are good things and when the, the, the church received this letter it was like here's your to do list people say we don't know what we're supposed to do but okay well here's a list follow it it gives us comfort we love our lists the thing is though God does not intend for our faith to just be slogans and quaint decorations Underlying every one of these Christian virtues is a statement about how we are to treat each other and the connection that how we treat each other has to our relationship with God. You want to get on my bad side? Be mean to my kids. Okay, now, we don't have to worry about getting on God's bad side, but I can tell you, God really doesn't like it when we're mean to his kids. He breaks God's heart when we treat each other poorly. As a parent, and my sons are grown men now, but when we all get together to see them laughing and talking and playing together, it just, it's a blessing. It just, it fills my heart with joy, quite literally. When they get crosswise with each other and start fussing and fighting and they're brothers, so they will continue to do that forever and ever, I'm in, I'm sad to say. But I, I don't like that. I want to fix that. I, I, and a lot of times I can't do anything to fix it other than just let them know this isn't, no, I don't like this, guys. Do better. Do you think that God who knows us and loves us more than I could ever know and love my kids, that it doesn't just break God's heart when we don't treat each other with love? Now, in all things, there must be balance. There really must be. It's not like, okay, well, you're too good, so you need to throw a little evil in to kind of balance it out. That's not what I'm talking about, balancing. You want all the good you can and minimize the evil. But it's not enough to shout, praise Jesus and hallelujah, if our hearts are cold and empty of love. It's easy to just say the words. But if we're not feeling love in our hearts, we run very close to filling our hearts with something truly evil, and that is contempt. Contempt is so much more destructive than just anger in our relationships because you can be angry with someone and still see them as an equal. I've seen that. I've experienced that. That anger that says, you know, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. You should know what you're talking about. You don't, but you're just wrong. Contempt, with contempt, the other person has to be lower, has to be less. And in the absence of love, contempt blossoms. So the way that works is you're wrong because you're an inferior person. You're not hardly even a human being. You're dirt. You're disgusting. Do you see the difference? I disagree with you. You're filth. That's the difference between anger and contempt. And it seems as if contempt is just growing and growing in our culture, in our society, in our day-to-day -day lives. And we must root it out. Now, in our zeal to be righteous, too often... Our religion has become more important than God. And so we cling to it because it's a list of rules. And we like that. And we sacrifice the people of the present to idolize the heroes of the past. You know those young people, they're just no good anymore. Oh, those old people, they're not like the old people I used to know. 
That kind of stuff doesn't help anybody. We condemn everyone who is impure, who falls short, reserving God's mercy and grace only for ourselves. You know, those sinners over there, those bad people over there, those worthless people over there. Contempt makes it possible to say garbage like that. Or we say, you know, we don't love money, even though in our heart of hearts, it's the comfort and the security that money brings that really attracts us. And so instead of being generous and being loving, we hoard and cling and hold on to and grasp. And then the way that plays out with our church vows is that we then trust God to work miracles with the crumbs of our blessings and the change from our pockets. Oh God, I want you to do something amazing in my church. I really want you to, to change my community. I want you to change the world. Oh, well, do you tithe? Oh, well, I've got, I've got a couple of dollars left over from this weekend. I can throw a couple of dollars in. Do not hear me say that if you don't tithe, you're a bad person. Okay? But what I'm saying is that we have been blessed so richly. And instead of sharing that the way it was designed, we have been blessed to be a blessing. We're to be a channel of grace. When God says, here, let me give you these blessings. He's not saying, let me give them just to you. He's saying, let me entrust them to you because I want you to distribute them. I want you to share them. Let others enjoy these things. And when we don't do that, we get frustrated and say, well, God doesn't come through. Really? You closed off the spigot of grace and then wondered why there wasn't any flowing. Be open-handed in your generosity and in your caring. The form of Christianity, well, I put something in the plate. Did you do it with love? Did you do it as an act of gratitude? Did you do it just to impress somebody that was sitting next to you? The form of Christianity may be there, but the substance is missing. It's not enough to do wonderful things and tremendous works and then mark it all down to luck or chance or coincidence. You know, when we pray for a miracle and God comes through and our response is say, we got lucky. Oh. How do you feel when you've worked really hard to help somebody achieve what they want and then instead of them just saying a simple thank you, they thank everybody but you? Or they say, oh, what a coincidence. Wasn't that amazing that that just happened? We need to get better about giving God the credit. And that's where the love thing comes back in again. Over and over and over, do you, do you hear that in the scriptures where Christ is talking to people? He's not saying that religious observances and being faithful in your, to your church are bad things, but he's saying if you do it and there's no love in you, it's a waste of time. If you do it and that becomes more important to you than God, that's wrong. If your life is not governed by love, but just by a list of things to do, how very sad. How very sad. God has blessed us to be a blessing. And the least we can do is to give God some good press when miracles happen. Think about it. When was the last time you experienced a miracle and then told somebody, I saw a miracle. I received a miracle. Now, when a baby is born, we're real good about it. Oh, it's a little miracle, isn't he? Look at this child. Isn't she just a miracle? We do that. Or if somebody is gravely ill and they suddenly go into remission, we say, it was a miracle. But there are miracles happening in our lives every day. 
The fact that you can draw a breath. For some people, that's a miracle. The fact that we can communicate with people on the other side of the world. Well, that's just technology, Darren. No, it's a miracle. Routinely, we do things every day that a hundred years ago people have said, Oh, you're a witch. Oh, it's, it's magic. But they're miracles that God has placed in our hands through technology, through science, through all kinds of things. But they're gifts from God. And we need to give God the credit and say thank you. We need to be praising God with who we are and what we do and what we say. And what is most important? Okay? There, I've read this several times, but they say, you know, when you're organizing your day, you should sit down and write down everything that you absolutely need to do. Put it on your to-do list and then go through and find the top three to five things that are most important. Not most urgent, but the things that are most necessary, most important. Put them at the top of the list and then throw the rest of the list away. And just focus on those three to five things and get them done. Do what's most important. Easier said than done. Easier said than done. The most important thing, and there are many ways to say it, to express it, to share what is most important. But what is most important is the fact. Not the theory, not the guess, not the hypothesis but the stone-cold fact that God loves you. God lo that is not a question. God loves you? No. That is an imperative, a statement. God loves you. And if you don't know this and don't believe this and don't claim this, everything else will never be enough. You can have all the money in the world. You can have all of the stuff in the world. You can have thousands of people that are your friends on social media. But if you don't know that God loves you and believe that, all of that will fall short. It will never be enough. This truth is the greatest of God's blessings to know that God loves you. Think about that. The most powerful being in all creation knows your name and address. Has an eye on you every minute of the day. Aren't you glad that that being made a special effort to say, oh, and I want you to be sure you know I do this because I love you. Otherwise, we would be in terror all the time waiting for the hammer to drop. God loves you. And if you want to really experience this blessing, help someone else to believe it, to receive it, to know it. When people come back from mission trip, and you've seen this, I know you have. They come back and their faces are just, oh, almost shining. Not just with sweat, but just shining. They're all like they're lit up inside. There's a switch is turned on. And it's because they have just spent an intense week or two of helping other people know that God loves them. And they come back and they are just jazzed up, electrified. Because they have been a channel of God's grace. And that is not why we do it so that we can get a, a, an emotional spiritual high. We do it because it's a good thing to do. We do it because it's what we were created to do. I have never met a single person that God made that was a reservoir. Okay? where everything was to go in there and just stay there. When God places a blessing in our hands, it's so that it can pass through. That was a big revelation when I understood about spiritual gifts. If you have the gift of hospitality and you don't share that with other people, 
what are you doing? If you've got the gift of, of money management and you don't ever put that to the service of the church, what are you doing? When we share these gifts, it's a way to help other people know that God loves them. And that's the most important thing that should be on anybody's list. If you go back to those seven virtues that I read at the beginning, they're all about helping somebody to know that God loves them. Treat others with love and compassion and then credit God with what you do and the world will change. May all we do be in service to Christ. Amen.